Hello lovelies, this is your summary for everything you need for your AQA, A-Level Biology, Topic 3, Organism Exchange Substances with Their Environment. Just rolls off the tongue, that one, for some tips. And um, I'm going to go through everything that you need here. To go with this, there is a checklist, so you can follow along and tick off the bits that you need to, and then if you find any gaps, go and watch the more detailed, in-depth video to fill in those gaps. You can then follow that up with the online course or the essay book or the math and science book or the millions of things I have waiting for you over my website. Surface area to volume ratio. Cells need to move things around from A to B, generally across a partially permeable membrane. There are certain ways that we can take a short distance here in purple and actually fit quite a lot of membrane on it. The more membrane there is, the more opportunities there are for things to diffuse across. One example would be cells need to take in oxygen and need carbon dioxide removed. Nutrients need to be moved to the correct location. Urea needs to be excreted. And heat needs to be evenly distributed. To ensure that this exchange is as effective as possible, the surface area needs to be as large as possible in comparison to the volume. Smaller organisms have a larger surface area to volume ratio. It takes a long time for substances to move from the outside to the inside of a larger organism. Here we can use cubes as an example. We're going to look at a large animal and a small animal. This large animal has a surface area of 86 centimetres squared and a volume of 48 centimetres cubed. Dividing this gives us a surface area to volume ratio of 1.8. A small animal represented by one cube will have a surface area of six centimetres squared, one centimetre cubed. So the surface area to volume ratio here is six which is much higher than 1.8. The smaller animal has a larger surface area to volume ratio. A few maths hints to take note of here that there are no units for a ratio. If the question is talking about cells, think sphere and use 4 pi r squared. For a circle, it is pi r squared or for a cylinder, it is 2 pi r h plus 2 pi r squared. Gas exchange in plants. Plants need to exchange oxygen, carbon dioxide and water and this all needs to be done via their leaves. Guard cells control the opening and the closing of stomata. Stomata are generally on the underside of leaves. There are internal connecting air spaces that will allow the rapid diffusion of gases. The opening and closing of these controls the rate of diffusion. Gas exchange in xerophytic plants is slightly different. These need to control water loss. Plants can be adapted for hot environments, cold or dry environments, or very windy environments. In all of these, loss of water is an issue. They could have hairs on the epidermis to trap water, a thick or waxy cuticle, curved or rolled up leaves, 
The stomata could be in pits or grooves, or there could be fewer stomata. They could also have a reduced surface area to volume ratio. A gas exchange in single-celled organisms, because they are very small, they will have a large surface area to volume ratio. Meaning substances can easily diffuse from one place to another. So there is no need for a specialised system. Gas exchange in insects using a grasshopper as an example. They have a small series of tubes called tracheoles. These extend the whole way throughout the insect's body. Air is brought directly to the tissue, allowing for a short diffusion distance. Gases will move according to their diffusion gradients. This is helped by the rhythmic movement of the insect's abdominal muscles to move air in and out. Gas enters and leaves the system via spiracles on the surface of the insect. These open and close via a valve. Gas exchange in fish gills is something you've hopefully looked at in class. While dissecting a fish gill might be one of the smellier practicals that you do, it really helps you to see how the gill filaments separate out when they're put in water compared to when they're in the air. If we look closely at a single gill filament, we can see there is deoxygenated blood on one half and then oxygenated blood on the other half. This is a single gill filament. Blood will flow in this direction and water will flow in the opposing direction. This countercurrent system maintains a constant gradient. The respiratory system is where gas exchange in humans takes place. We have the alveoli. These are tiny little air sacs right at the end of the system. They are surrounded by collagen and lined with epithelium. We have bronchioles. These are subdivisions of the bronchi. They have walls made of muscles. The bronchi are two subdivisions of the trachea. And the trachea, this is made from cartilage to protect it. The ribcage has a protective function. Overall, this is contained in the lungs, the large structure where you'll find all the alveoli and bronchioles. The diaphragm moves up and down to draw air in and out, and all of these work together. When we think about the mechanics of breathing, we need to compare breathing in with breathing out. This can also be referred to as inspiration and expiration. Breathing in is an active process that requires energy. The external intercostal muscles contract. The internal intercostal muscles relax. The diaphragm contracts. The volume of the lungs increase. The pressure within the lungs decreases and subsequently air is forced in. Conversely, breathing out is a passive process. The external intercostal muscles relax. The internal intercostal muscles contract. The diaphragm relaxes. The ribs move in a down and inwards direction. The volume decreases. 
the pressure within the lungs increases and subsequently air is forced out. Here we can see the alveolar epithelium. This is where gas exchange in the lungs takes place. These are tiny air sacs, approximately 100 to 300 micrometers in diameter. But with a total combined surface area spanning tens of meters squared. We have the alveolus cavity, the epithelial cells, the capillary surrounding it, and the air inside. Oxygen rich air will move into the lungs, to the alveoli down a pressure gradient. Red blood cells in capillaries will slow as they move around the alveoli. Oxygen will then diffuse down its concentration gradient. From the alveolus cavity across two layers of epithelial cells into the bloodstream. Red blood cells are flattened against the capillary walls to reduce the distance needed for diffusion. Carbon dioxide follows the opposite pathway. The movement of air in and out of the lungs maintains the concentration gradient. Lung disease affects a wide number of people. The impact of disease on the lungs can be reduced volume. It can affect the number of breaths per minute. It can affect the change in expiratory volume. Risk factors for lung disease include smoking, your occupation, local air pollution, any infections you've had and your genetic makeup. Examples of lung disease could be tuberculosis, fibrosis, asthma or emphysema. When I was working in the lab, the risk factor that I had was my occupation. So every three months, we used to have to go and do a test where we breathed as hard as we could and they measured our expiratory volume to check our lungs, basically. Digestion in humans involves a number of organs working together. We have the tongue, the salivary glands, the esophagus, the stomach that produces enzymes and digests food, the liver, the large intestine where water is absorbed, the small intestine where food is digested by enzymes and the products of digestion are absorbed. This has adaptations on the walls, microvilli, to increase the surface area and thus the rate of diffusion. Food can be digested physically, broken up with your teeth or chemically with enzymes. Carbohydrates is one polymer that needs to be digested. The monomers, the glucose, the monosaccharides are held together by a glycosidic bond. Enzymes can break the glycosidic bond by hydrolysis. Amylase will break down starch into maltose and amylase is produced in the mouth and the pancreas. Maltase will break down maltose into alpha glucose and this is produced in the ileum or small intestine. Sucrase will break down sucrose into glucose and fructose and lactase will break down lactose into glucose and galactose. Larger molecules, larger carbohydrates, will need more than one type of enzyme to fully break down into the substituent sugars. And this is one area where spelling and handwriting is going to be vitally important. Because if the examiner can't tell whether you've written sucrase or sucrose, you're not going to get the marks. 
Lipids or fats also need to be broken down. Here we have our triglyceride and here is the ester bond. Lipases will hydrolyze the triglycerides into monoglycerides and fatty acids and water. Lipases are made in the pancreas behind the liver and they work in the small intestine. Bile salts, which are made in the liver and stored in the gallbladder, emulsify fats into micelles, increasing the surface area, thus increasing the rate of digestion. Bile salts also help to neutralise stomach acid. Proteins also need to be broken down to be digested. Here we have a dipeptide made of two amino acids held together by our peptide bond. Here is a representation of a long polypeptide with the amino acids and the peptide bond. Endopeptidases will hydrolyze central peptide bonds. Exopeptidases hydrolyze peptide bonds at the end and dipeptidases will hydrolyze the peptide bond in a dipeptide. These are membrane bound. These are on the cell surface of the epithelial cells in the small intestine. These can be made in the pancreas and in the stomach. Once products have been broken down, they need to be absorbed. Here we have a close-up view of the small intestine, the tube going through, and then a close-up of the surface area of that tube. Once the carbohydrates, lipids and proteins are broken down, they need to be absorbed. These are covered by microvilli, which have a network of capillaries inside. It has a very large surface area, very thin walls. There is a movement of the muscles within it to maintain the concentration gradient. Glucose is absorbed by co-transport with sodium. Fructose is absorbed via facilitated diffusion and amino acids via active transport. Triglycerides are moved into micelles. These move towards the epithelium, allowing them to diffuse across. We have a closed double circulatory system. It is a double circulatory system because the heart will pump to the lungs and the heart will pump to the rest of the body. The heart, the pump, is needed due to a low surface area to volume ratio. Whenever you see a heart, right, right and left on the correct opposite sides just to remind you when you are labelling things. Blood will enter through the vena cava and exit to the lungs. It will come in from the lungs via the pulmonary vein and then exit via the aorta to the rest of the body. The path that blood takes, I'm going to teach you a little trick to help you remember it. So it comes in through the vena cava to the right atrium, then down to the right ventricle, out to the lungs via the pulmonary artery, back to the heart via the pulmonary vein, into the left atrium, down to the left ventricle and out to the rest of the body via the aorta. Now I've written them like this so you can see the pattern. It goes V, A, V, A, V, A, V, A. If your flow of blood does not follow that, for example, if you've got two A's next to each other or you've got two V's next to each other, either you've mislabeled something or you've drawn the path wrong. For required practical five, we are going to be looking at the dissection of an organ within a mass transport system, in this case, the heart. 
If you want to see all of the gory details, then you can go and watch my heart dissection video. But here we're just going to use an image. Within the heart, you should be able to find the aorta, the vena cava, the pulmonary artery going to the lungs, the pulmonary vein coming from the lungs, the left ventricle and left atrium, as well as the right ventricle and the right atrium. Notice I've written right and left as the first thing whenever I see a heart diagram. We have deoxygenated blood coming in through the vena cava, into the atrium, down to the ventricle, and then being pumped out via the pulmonary artery to the lungs. Oxygenated blood will come back from the lungs via the pulmonary vein in to the left atrium, down to the left ventricle, and then pumped around the rest of the body via the aorta. When looking at the heart, you will find valves. These are very thin but very strong. These open and close to control the direction of blood flow. The walls of the ventricle are much thicker. However, on the left-hand side of the heart, they are noticeably thicker than on the right-hand side. This is because instead of the right-hand side just has to pump to the lungs, the left-hand side has to pump the whole way round to the body. So instead of just pumping to the lungs, it pumps to the whole body and needs to be a thicker muscle. Hemoglobin in humans consists of four polypeptide chains. This is a protein's quaternary structure. They have heme groups which contain iron two ions in. And the heme groups are the part that actually combines with oxygen. Hemoglobin will combine with four oxygen molecules in a reversible reaction. Oxygen will readily associate with hemoglobin and readily dissociate with it. Meaning that hemoglobin can change its affinity for oxygen in different conditions. This is done by changing shape when other substances are present. This will happen at gas exchange surfaces. For example, in the lungs, there is a high oxygen concentration and a low carbon dioxide concentration. Meaning there will be a high affinity for oxygen and oxygen will load. At respiring tissue in the body, there will be a low oxygen concentration, a high carbon dioxide concentration. There will be a low affinity and oxygen will dissociate. You need to be able to interpret and sketch oxygen dissociation curves. At point A on this curve, it is very hard for the first oxygen molecule to bind. So at low oxygen concentrations, very little oxygen will actually bind. For example, this could be within respiring tissues. At point B, after the first oxygen binds, the shape of the quaternary structure changes making it easier for subsequent oxygens to bind. We can see this as there is only a small increase in partial pressure, whereas a steeper gradient happens at this part of the graph. There is positive cooperation. At point C, after the third oxygen molecule binds, it is harder to bind the fourth and the last oxygen. To talk about with this graph is the Bohr effect. So the concentration of carbon dioxide can also affect the loading of oxygen onto hemoglobin. If there is a low partial pressure of carbon dioxide, for example in the lungs, the affinity of hemoglobin is increased. 
within the lungs, there is a high concentration of oxygen. So oxygen is readily loaded onto hemoglobin. Where there is a high partial pressure of carbon dioxide, for example, in muscles or respiring tissue, the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen is lowered. This could be in the muscles, so oxygen easily dissociates and goes to where it's needed. Hemoglobin isn't the same in all animals. I have a little bit of a soft spot for horseshoe crabs because when I worked in America for a few summers, it was in a lab that kept horseshoe crabs and you'd have your gas tap, you'd have your water tap and you would have your salt water tap for the horseshoe crabs. Anyway, the reason they are so interesting in science is because they have blue blood because they use copper instead of iron in their hemoglobin. So differences in genetic code can lead to differences in quaternary structure of hemoglobin. Thus, different animals will have differences in oxygen affinity. This is one example of adaptation to an environment. There can be variances based on size. Smaller animals will have a higher surface area to volume ratio. Thus, they lose heat quickly. So we'll have a high oxygen affinity. If an animal lives in a low oxygen environment, it needs hemoglobin with a high oxygen affinity. If an animal has high activity levels, it needs to be able to quickly dissociate oxygen. So the hemoglobin needs a lower oxygen affinity. There are distinct parts to the cardiac cycle. In diastole, the heart relaxes. Blood will enter the heart via the pulmonary vein and vena cava. As the atria fill up, there is an increase in pressure. When atrial pressure is higher than ventricular pressure, the valves open and blood begins to flow from the atria to the ventricles. In systole, contraction of the atrial walls moves the rest of the blood down towards the ventricles. After the ventricles have filled up, the walls will contract. Ventricular pressure increases and the atrioventricular valves close. This further increases the pressure and blood is forced into the aorta and pulmonary artery. The aortic pressure rises as blood is forced in and then falls as the blood leaves. Ventricular pressure is low at first and then rises. This rises quickly after the valves close. Then falls as blood is forced into the aorta and pulmonary artery. Atrial pressure is always low-ish as the walls are very Thin, and this drops when the valves open. Ventricular volume increases as the atria contracts and they fill with blood. It then drops as the blood moves to the aorta and pulmonary artery. We can look at cardiac output as a calculation of stroke volume multiplied by heart rate. There are three main types of blood vessels that you need to know about. Arteries carry blood away from the heart. Arterioles are smaller arteries. Muscular walls. A thick elastic layer. Which is needed to keep the blood pressure high. And they have no valves. Veins carry blood towards the heart. They have thin muscular and elastic walls. 
valves at regular intervals to stop the blood flowing backwards, and capillaries. These carry blood to the organs and they allow exchange to take place. They are one layer of cells thick. They are highly branched and very narrow to allow for the rapid diffusion of gases, nutrients and ions into and out of the bloodstream. Cardiovascular disease affects a wide number of people. Atheroma is a build-up of fatty material under the epithelium, resulting in reducing capacity of the lumen, making it harder for blood to pass through. An aneurysm is a bubble, forming on the side wall of an artery, weakening the artery, and it can pop due to pressure. A myocardial infarction is more commonly known as a heart attack. Here, the heart muscle will stop receiving oxygen, so it stops working. Thrombosis is a blood clot that can block veins, arteries or tiny capillaries, especially if it gets dislodged. Water will move around the plants via the xylem. Water will enter plants via the roots and needs to move around the plant to where it is needed. Evaporation of water from the leaves creates a force that pulls water up via the xylem. This is a passive process. Hydrogen bonds between water molecules ensure cohesion and thus a continuous flow of water across the mesophyll cells and the xylem. Transpiration pull means the xylem is under pressure. If this is broken and air enters the xylem, then this pull is also broken. We can measure transpiration, how well the xylem is working, with a potometer, an air bubble, is introduced and we can follow that movement and measure the movement of the air bubble. The stem of the plant needs to be cut underwater so that we don't introduce any air bubbles and the mean volume of water loss can be calculated. A few variables you could change in this experiment are humidity, temperature, light intensity or the colour of light. The phloem is responsible for the transportation of inorganic ions from the roots and sugars produced by photosynthesis to wherever they are needed. The best theory we have for this at the moment is the mass flow theory. Sucrose is transferred into sieve tube elements. The mass flow of sucrose through the sieve tube elements via a hydrostatic gradient. There is some evidence for this. Sieve tubes are under pressure. There is a concentration gradient and there is some evidence against this. Not all solutes move at the same rate and a sieve by its structure would appear to be a barrier to movement. This is why in some videos I have unexplained scratches.